Okay, good evening. Uh, so the topic of our chat this evening is chronic osteitis, and I've also included fracture-related infections because it's not really something that's uh, covered elsewhere, and it's um, uh, and there's obviously quite a quite a lot of lot of overlap. So I'm going to go through the um, all the theory first, and then we'll look at a lot of cases. Um, like I said, I'm just going to switch my camera off to try and decrease the necessary bandwidth. Um, if, uh, if there is any questions, interrupt me at any time, either put up your hand or just put on your mic and put on your mic and shout. Okay, so we're gonna look at the definition, classification, management strategies, and then lots of cases. So one of the problems with chronic osteitis is that uh, there's no clear definition or there's lots of different definitions for when we can actually call something chronic osteitis. So um, even though we use the term chronic, there's no specific time frame attached to, um, uh, to when we can call an infection chronic. In some cases in the literature, six months is used. Um, this is probably uh, the best definition that I like to, to use from Len Marais' work that was published a few, uh, few years ago. And that's that chronic osteitis is a progressive destruction of bone and opposition as, of new bone as a reparative process. So you require both a sequestrum and also involucrum. So basically, the infection becomes chronic once there's a sign of a host response. So periosteal reaction or new, new uh, evidence of new bone formation. CNN in 2011 simply defined chronic osteitis as a biofilm-based infection of bone, which is also useful. So chronic osteitis can be secondary to, to hematogenous osteitis. So uh, acute hematogenous osteitis, mostly a childhood disease. And, and then if it's not appropriately managed, and can, or if it presents late, can become can become chronic. Um, then contiguous spread is probably the rarest form. This is where um, infections spread to bone from adjacent soft tissue infection. This is mostly chronic wounds. Examples here are uh, diabetic feet, uh, chronic venous stasis ulcers, and also contiguous uh, chronic osteitis from adjacent septic joints are seen as a, as, as contiguous spread. Direct oculation, or well, this is mostly during surgery or during open fractures. So this is this is the biggest group in, in sort of modern orthopedics, and this is secondary to either surgery or open open fractures. So there's direct inoculation, bacteria causing infection. And there's been a massive increase over the past century. And this is due to even though with operative orthopedic, the incidence of inf uh, uh, the uh, uh, incidence of infection. Uh, have decreased, the overall number of infections have increased, and that's because of uh, the increase in operative orthopedics. So high velocity trauma and the increase in surgical implants usage. So as I said, it's a biofilm based infections of bone where the majority of the organisms are sessile, not planktonic, as in other infections. And obviously being in this biofilm, um, increases the resistance of the infection against traditional treatment methods. And I like this one statement from an article that said, once attached to a biofilm, uh, once a biofilm is attached to a non-viable surface, the only way to eradicate it is to terminate the host of physically removing it. Now, in, in dealing with uh, people, we can't always terminate the host, unfortunately. Okay, so basically, a biofilm uh, is this glycocalyx that's made of polysaccharides where there's lots of bacteria and through different mechanisms the resistance of the infection can be increased up to a thousand fold and it's difficult to penetrate and there's only certain uh, treatment strategies that we need to use uh, to, be, uh, to be active against a biofilm. So there are various different classification systems for chronic osteitis and why is it so difficult to classify? Well, firstly, it includes such a wide variety of clinical scenarios. A lot of the older definitions also don't take into account or not meant for, 
for uh, osteoarthritis is really the secondary to implants. So it's a Cerny and Maney classification. It's the classic one. They described the original uh, patient cohort in 1985, and they had 189 patients, of which they managed to salvage them in 143. It was the first classification really system really to guide treatment, um, but didn't actually uh, intend to include implant-related sepsis. It was really meant for chronic osteitis secondary to hematogenous spread, and they divided to uh, osteitis into one of chronic osteitis into one of four subtypes: type one, two, three, four, where one is medullary, two is superficial, three is localized, and four is diffused. They also described a host classification system, uh, which is uh, which is useful, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. Hoffman modified this a little bit later, and this is only really changing the terminology, and this is the classification system that we or I still like to use uh, at this time, where type 1 is medullary infection, 2 is cortical, 3 is cortical medullary, and 4 is structural. Then there's a few other classifications that I wouldn't sort of expect you guys to know the whole classification system, but there are some aspects of it that's quite useful. Um, and I'll just go through them. So Romano was the first Italian um, infection surgeon, and he was the first guy to really look at um, infection post fracture fixation. And he described this classification system that's called the ICS classification that stands for infection callus and stability. And he uh, divided the infection into type one, two, and three. Type one infection, the stable fixation with progressive union. Type two, the stable fixation, no progressive union. And type three, uh, unstable fixation, absence of union. And that really guided uh, one of the classification that guides our management of infected fracture or fracture related infections. We'll discuss a bit more about that. This is the quite a comprehensive classification, the so called seven item comprehensive classification system. And you can see here that they've uh, taken more factors into, into consideration, including the clinical presentation. Um, the area of the leg, of the, of the body, um, the microorganism, whether there's a bone defect or not, or whether there's a soft tissue defect or not. Unfortunately, like in all um, comprehensive classification system, once a classification system is so complex that you can't remember it out of the top of your head, then it's not really useful in clinical practice. So uh, Lynn Marais, as part of his PhD, published a series of articles and he published this modified staging system for chronic osteomyelitis, which is really what I use. And this is the um, using the same anatomical classification um, as the Sini and Maida, but he went into more detail uh, classifying hosts into type A, B, and C, just like Sini and Maida, but taking a more modern host risk factors into consideration, including HIV, which wasn't around at the time of Sini and Maida. Um, also something worthwhile knowing about, this is called the Bach classification from Martin McNally from the Bone Infection Unit in Oxford. Uh, he described the Bach classification. So again, it's not something I routinely use, but there's a few aspects of it that, that's important. Bach is an acronym uh, that stands for, B is for bone involvement, A is for antimicrobial options, C is for coverage by soft tissue, and H is for host stations, and then uh, classify the um, infections into uncomplicated, complex, and limited, limited options. And the limited option ones basically is infections where, uh, you know, uh, there's no real chance of success with uh, attempted curative surgery. What's important here that you can see in chronic osteitis where there's a joint, adjacent joint involved, it immediately becomes a complex um, with chronic infection of a joint, it's very difficult to eradicate without resecting the joint. So this is one useful thing uh, from this classification, uh, that the moment the joint's involved, it becomes complex and uh, you're less likely to, to succeed uh, compared to uncomplicated chronic osteitis. So my take when it comes to the classification is the senior and major 
anatomical uh, classification remains the sort of gold standard that we use. It's simple, it's reproducible, and it guide treatment. Um, use the Mare modified staging system to stratify the host. And just think of the Romano classification to guide the treatment of fracture related and infections. Any questions up to this up to this point about the classification? So the overall principles of management, and you can see that there's a lot of repetition here, but this is basically like um, when you present any complex trauma case that you would mention the ABCDs, your ATLS principles, ABCDs, it should become practice when you manage these complex cases and that you should manage things like uh, optimizing the host. So first, first step in, in management is patient optimization, surgery, and then culture-specific antibodies. We'll go into a little bit more detail. So you want to classify the local disease to decide on the local classification helps you to think of the different treatment options. Uh, if you just use this term stratify and optimize the host in the exam, you know, that tells us you've thought about that, you thought about uh, classifying the host, but also identifying potential um, aspects from the host that can be optimized prior to surgery. Pathogen identification, I put in brackets a little bit, it's really nowadays that um, we do a initial biopsy to identify the pathogen prior to definitive surgery, but sometimes if the diagnosis is unclear, um, we would do that. And then the surgical debridement is made up of, the surgical treatment is made up of debridement, specimen collector, collection, dead space management, soft tissue and bony reconstruction, and then culture-directed antibiotic therapy. This is the host stratification system described by, by Len Marais. And for someone to be a type B host, you can have three, fewer than three minor local, minor uh, risk factors, systemic or, or local. And once you have one major risk factor or three and more minor risk factors, you become a type C, type C host. This is a picture from um, our weekly multidisciplinary team meeting in the bone infection unit. And the important message here that these are very complex patients. Uh, lots of them had uh, multiple previous operations, have comorbidities, and very important to manage these in a multidisciplinary team setting. Now, you don't all have to be in a bone and joint infection unit, but you should uh, pull all the resources you, you have together and, um, you know, discuss these patients uh, on a regular basis to try and achieve a, a good result. Unfortunately, there's not many of the host factors that we can change. Um, things like nutrition, anemia, diabetic control, thyroid control, low vitamin D, uh, depression, alcohol use and smoking can sometimes be optimized preoperatively. And also don't forget to look at the local vasculature. So sometimes when someone has poor uh, blood supply to his leg, that can be altered by referring the patient to a vascular surgeon and having a revascularization of his, uh, of his limb. So we often borrow this term when we discuss infection treatment, the so-called oncological approach. And, uh, this is a phrase we use in tumor patients where we say we use a disciplinary approach in a specialized unit uh, to get an accurate tissue diagnosis, local and systemic uh, staging, excision of the tumor, and then chemotherapy. And this can be adapted to infection where we uh, also need to do uh, local staging, uh, stage the host, so systemic stage and surgery, although here we don't have to cut out the tumor. So we use the term judicious, which means you just cut out what is necessary and then chemotherapy, which is antibiotics. So just looking a little bit general at the management strategy and the history, 
very important to ask about uh, previous procedures and antibiotic history. These are specific cases that we are unsure whether there is infection present. Um, so no sinus, no heart signs of infection, but there's a non-union, the patient has increased pain. Um, patients often don't volunteer the fact that they had an infection. So I see a patient in my rooms, uh, they say they never had any problems of infection after their fracture fixation. Um, but then on interrogation, I said, oh, yes, but the wound did take two months to, to heal and I had multiple back dressings and I had multiple causes of augmented by the sur surgeon. So specifically ask about multiple procedures, prolonged wound healing and antibiotics after fracture, fi after fracture fixation. General examination, specifically locally, looking at the state of the soft tissue, neurovascular status, examination, uh, you know, there's no real place in acute infection uh, or chronic infection for uh, a CRP, definitely no role in local sepsis for a PCT. ESR, only really useful in people that are HIV negative and HIV positive patients that are chronically uh, raised, but it can be useful in HIV negative patients and also sometimes to monitor trend. I routinely do an albumin, HbA1c, HIV test, and vitamin D, and optimize those if they're not um, if they're not optimally treated. Anatomical imaging. I'll start with an X-ray. When it comes to special investigation, well, you know, when I worked in the bone infection unit uh, in the UK, every patient had a CT and an MRI scan. So obviously, the CT is good to look at bony anatomy. So for C sequestrum and and um, uh, better than an MRI scan, but the MRI scan gives a lot of extra information, uh, shows soft tissue collection, um, you know, uh, edema or in the soft tissue or in the bone. So for most of the cases, especially with an uh, implant, I use an MRI scan uh, uh, and on top of an X-ray and I don't routinely get a CT scan for these cases as well. So for me, I can see enough of the bony anatomy on the MRI scan uh, that I usually don't need a don't need a CT scan. So micro, just important here. Again, there's no place for wound or sinus swabs. That's just like you know, uh, basically swabbing the disc. Um, so we want tissue samples, which is mostly open because the patient almost always need other surgery as well. We want multiple specimens. Uh, we don't want to biopsy the devitalized tissue. So if there's a, you know, a, a, a large open sinus, we want to remove all of that tissue and we want to, want to uh, biopsy the tissue after the obvious infected devitalized tissue has been removed. Because otherwise, just like a sinus can be recognized by other pathogens, this can also basically uh, have uh, organisms that's not representative of these that actually cause the infection. Extended cultures, while routinely at our lab, all orthopedic specimens are um, cultured for two weeks. So you don't have to write on the form extended cultures. It automatically happens if you, if you write it's a query infected implant or, uh, or, or orthopedic infection. Um, However, if you work in another place, you must be sure these are often low virulence organisms. And this is very important to increase your yield. You need the patient to be off antibiotics for at least two weeks. So unless the patient is systemically unwell or has large abscess or extensive cellulite to stop antibiotics, the patient is on antibiotics and wait two weeks before your, um, before your sampling. This is the management algorithm from Len Marie's article, uh, which is quite quite useful um, to basically dictate the, the management. And you can see here that the first question is whether what host status the patient is. And unfortunately, your outcome is very much related to the patient host status. In other words, in a type C host with a large structural um, osteitis, there might be no realistic chance of success and it's better to, to consider salvage procedures, which could either be nothing or uh, an amputation.
presentation. So in, able, in order to achieve success, we need a thorough debridement, we need a competent and optimized host response, and we need pathogen-specific antibiotics. What are the poor prognostic indicators for success? Well, if you just look at micro, if you have a mixed infection, uh, the, the chance of success is lower than a, a single sensitive organism. Multi-resistant organisms, specifically MRSA, do poorer compared to, to sensitive organisms. Also, when you have no growth. Well, not because um, no growth really is risk factor, but it obviously just means that your antibiotic uh, therapy is just a guess. Um, also, poor host status. Um, increases your chance of treatment of treatment failure. So let's talk about the type C host first. Well if you look at um, if you look at uh, Sydney's original series from America, um, that, as I said, was a hundred and something patient. He subsequently published a much la larger series of more than 2,200 patients treated for osteitis. And in his series using his classification system, he only had 4% of cases classified as type C hosts. And Lynn Murray using the same classification system in Peter Marisburg had a third of his patients classify as a as a type C host, and, and that's more, probably more or less the same the end of environment, environment that we, that we um, uh, work. Uh, probably a third of our patients type C hosts. So um, with that, we've taken that into, that, uh, that into consideration when we select patients for, for management. So the treatment in type C host, we say is palliative treatment, and this can be chronic suppressive antibiotic therapy. Now, in my, uh, that's another debate. Uh, that um, you know, one can talk about is that I still firmly believe that all and even palliative chronic suppressive antibiotic therapy should be culture specific. In other words, if you want to treat someone with, with suppressive antibiotics, you should still at least do a biopsy to get a tissue culture, because otherwise, your your um, your uh, it's it's just as good as guessing. If we look at uh, our micro from a paper we published more than. Uh, 200 uh, chronic osteitis cases between ourselves and, and, and Tigerberg. Um, only half of our infections are, are gram positive sensitive to flu clocks. Never mind the fact that flu clocks doesn't penetrate bone well. So the old practice of just handing out handful, hands full of, of, of flu clocks tablets, even if uh, uh, just looking at the antibiotic sensitivity, you're less than 50% you have a less than 50% chance of covering that organism with the antibiotic that, you, that you're handing out. So palliative care can be suppressive. It can be skillful neglect, so just nothing. Um, if patient presents with a large abscess, you can just do an IND or an intralesional debridement to decrease the infective burden, get cultures, and treat the patient with uh, suppressive antibiotics. And then other salvage options like amputation, like amputation. But sometimes when a patient have a leg that they can walk on with a sinus, they're better off, um, you know, keeping keeping their leg, especially if the access to a prosthetic is not always predictable. And this is, this, as you can see, that part of the treatment uh, management protocol by, by Lynn. So in type A and type B host, here we'll embark on a curative treatment strategy. And our aim is to do a thorough debridement. Um, the term we like to use is judicious. This is not a tumor. We don't have to cut it out with a margin. Um, in other words, the aim of our treatment is not to remove all infected tissue because infected tissue that still vascularize, antibiotics can reach. Dead tissue, antibiotic can't reach. So the term eugicious, eugicious just basically means to cut out what is necessary. And um, so we remove all devitalized uh, tissue, both bone and soft tissue, um, because the Infected tissue that's still vascularized can be targeted with antibiotics. Then we want to further dilute the infected version by lavage. Um, there's no proof, uh, no proof that antiseptics makes a difference, so we just use normal saline. 
and um, high volume, low pressure wash. You need to manage the dead space, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that now. Skeletal stabilization if necessary, and then soft tissue and bony reconstruction if indicated. So CNE initially published very rigid treatment guidelines. In other words, for type one, you needed to do a unroofing and dead space management. For type two, decortication, soft tissue cover. cover. Um, later, himself abandoned these rigid guidelines and advocated a more tailor-made approach for each patient, which is what we do. However, we use guidelines to guide our treatment um, according to guidelines and then individualize it for each patient. And he said that you should ask three questions. Is there a need for soft tissue reconstruction? Is the mechanical integrity of the remaining bone? And should you have to manage the, the dead space? So just a little bit about the debridement. As I said, judicious is the time, is a term we like to use at the moment. This is like anything in the exam. The moment you say judicious, then the examiners know that um, you, you know, up to date with the most recent uh, literature and that um, you're using the cor correct term terminology. Margin, there's no clear guide for the margin. Some literature, five millimeters is, is, is used. Like I said, this is not a tumor. You don't have to cut out, uh, out. you just need to remove all the divide plus tissue. So we like to use the term judicious. You want at least four uh, tissue specimens um, and then thorough, thorough irrigation. And then, so if you just summarize the treatments, the surgical strategy, as I said here from, from Len's article, the debridement, dead space management, soft tissue, uh, reconstruction, uh, skeletal reconstruction if it's necessary, and adjuvant antibiotics. So why do we need to manage the dead space? Well, uh, Sini uh, gave this quote in his original article, it said, any bone void which fill with hematoma or fluid, which provides a poorly vascularized environment conductive for residual organs to pr proliferate. So once you leave a large cavity that will just fill with blood, becomes, which becomes poorly vascularized scar tissue, which is again a, a, a poorly vascularized area where organisms can proliferate. Guys, just excuse me one second so I can just... Uh, Sorry, guys, that was just a word calling me again. Okay, so what can we use for, for, uh, for uh, dead space management? Well, there's lots of different options. Um, it, uh, dead space can be managed with just soft tissue. Um, uh, so this can be just basically uh, shortening. So for bone, so if we have a, a resected some bone and we shorten it, that can help us to fill the dead space. Um, sometimes, Back therapy can be used as a bridge, specifically as a bridge therapy. Um, and then a flap, especially in superficial cases, can be our dead space management. And then um, our, one of our mainstays of, of dead space management is what we call uh, uh, um, synthetic grafts that will also have the added benefit of giving local antibiotics. And these can be absorbable or non-absorbable. Historically, uh, we use gentamicin beads, uh, you know, the, the Downside to that is you needed the second stage to just remove the, the um, beads and um, just to remove the beads. But now we use synthetic absorbable carriers that um, does not have to be removed. So what's the ideal void filler? Well, the ideal void filler is biocompatible, bioabsorbable, eludes high levels of local antibiotics and able to provide mechanical strength and osteoconductive. We're not 100% sure this exists yet, and I'll discuss all the options with you. So why local antibiotics? Well, you can achieve a much greater local concentration, and it is safe to give because you don't get any of the synthetic, uh, any of the uh, systemic uh, side effects. So, uh, and even organisms that's resistant to an antibiotic, uh, locally you can achieve such high doses that you can often overcome the, 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 the levels needed uh, to, to treat. So in other words, even if, a, if an organism is resistant to an antibiotic, 
locally high dose can still be effective. So there's a variety of vehicles how it can be delivered. The uh, Lautenbach irrigation system is, is one. I'm not too fond of that. You know, it's quite messy and requires quite a lot of input in the ward after surgery. Non-absorbable um, uh, cement beads or, or spaces. And then absorbable, you get collagen sponges like Garacol or Colatemt. You get the calcium sulfates and phosphates, of which there's a variety available on the market. A bioactive glass. Uh, it's also it's not a it's not a antibiotic per se, more antiseptic because it kills organisms by decreasing the pH. And so I just want to spend a little bit of time on ceramint. So ceramint is a biphasic uh, synthetic. A graft that's made up of calcium sulfate and calcium phosphate in the form of hydroxyapatite. So calcium sulfate is very good at delivering antibiotics, and this is what we uh, uh, what's the what's the ingredient in Stimulan, which you re read a lot of in the literature. We don't have Stimulan available in South Africa, um, uh, but we have Osteoset, and it eludes antibiotics for about four weeks and it's very good at delivering uh, uh, antibiotics. It does dissolve quicker than bone can form. So it's not very good at stimulating bone formation. So ceramide is biphasic in the sense that it's calcium sulfate and phosphate, and the phosphate takes longer to absorb and is good at bone, stimulating bone formation. So in, this is the initial series of, of Martin McCann, the bone infection unit in Oxford, 100 patients, type three and four chronic osteitis treated with ceramide, but uh, exciting here, yeah, even small defects up to segmental defects up to two centimeters were treated with um, with uh, the ceramint, and they had a ninety six percent success or success rate at twelve months, which is of course very 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 good. Now ceramint was not available in South Africa up to recently. It is now available and distributed by by Acumet. One of the problems is it's very expensive, so we only have the ten cc. Um, uh, preparation available here, and and it, it is forty eight thousand rand for ten cc. Often in infective cases, um, I'll, you know, like for infected now, I use up to thirty cc. They're very expensive, so I use um, off label Prodens from Right Medical, which is the exact same chemical uh, synthetic graft, also also calcium sulfate and hydroxyapatite. Um, but I just mix it myself with antibiotics. It's still expensive, but it's more cost effective than ceramic. And this is just proof that histologically uh, it stimulates bone formation. So there's a mean void filling at 12 months of 70% of the defect with bone stimulation. So bone forming stimulation. So what is my choice of um, synthetic graft or, or what's my choice of dead space management according to the CNE and MADA chronic osteomyelitis type, type. So for one, which is intramedullary, which are mostly infected nails, I use the antibiotic cement nail or injectable um, uh, prodens, which I'll show some examples of. For type two, as I said, these are mostly cortical. And here your soft tissue reconstruction is your dead space management. Type three, these are cortical medullary. These where you usually have a, a and uh, not have a segmental defect, but you have a contained defect of the debridement. And if it's very small, you can just use uh, garacol or can use calcium sulfate or calcium phosphate as well. Type four, these are structural cases. This is where there's a segmental bone defect. If it's a small defect, you, the dead space management can be shortening or you can maintain length and insert the spacer and do the bony reconstruction as a second stage. So for the bony reconstruction, this is not really part of tonight's topic because it's a massive topic in itself. And uh, just uh, the bony reconstruction would be uh, individualized according to the size of the defect and the limb segment involved is all I would say at this stage. In other words, uh, so sort of this reconstructive ladder, depending on the size of the defect in the tibia. Just remember that the definition of a critical defect is any defect expected not to heal without further intervention. And it depends on the size, the location of the defect, and also the uh, surgeon's expertise. 
an important thing uh, to just remember, and this is where people something that people don't always understand well, and it is very seldom necessary to destabilize bone. In other words, structural osteitis is cases that's an infected non-union or where there's a pathological fracture. If the bone is in continuity, uh, luckily with infection, the bone is often sclerotic. And it's very rarely that you have to do a segmental resection for bone that's intact. In other words, if the bone is intact, it means that there's usually enough healthy bone to withstand the physiological, physiological forces. Soft tissue reconstruction, and this is a very important aspect that's often neglected. And if it's not addressed, decreases your chances of success. So back therapy is maybe acceptable bridge therapy for a few days. Um, for effective cases, but what you really want is good soft tissue because bone gets most of its blood supply from soft tissue. So if you want to use a back, it should be days rather than weeks. Um, we're not sure exactly where this newer irrigation aspiration systems fit in because here you can deliver um, some solutions that contain fluids that has an effect against bio. Uh, um, against uh, biofilm like the surfactants and that could be beneficial in infections um, so like a vac install um, where you can infuse prontostan or equivalent could be effective against a biofilm and can be used in, 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 in select cases and then there's no difference between the muscle and fascial cutaneous flap but our preference for um, for infection. As I said, historically, there was a preference for muscle flaps and infection because of the supposed better, better blood supply. This is just an example of an infected ankle orthodesis. Uh, where you can see there on the left now, that's poor skin graft, large sinus, just like you need to resect all the infected bone. This is after my debridement. You can see a big hole. Uh, you can see some of the bone and some uh, bro dense exposed there, and this is after the plastic surgeon followed me by doing a free radial forearm flap. So, single versus two stage, well, we mostly aim for single stage surgery, uh, and that can be as effective as stage surgery, providing that you are able to achieve an aseptic enough uh, environment. Uh, you can fold the bone defect, stabilize the, the skeleton. And to provide provide it, uh, provide soft tissue cover in the same in the same setting. Before I say something about uh, fracture related infections, um, let me stop there to see is there if there's any questions. Any questions? Okay, now. This is very confusing, I, I understand, because there's obviously an overlap between fracture-related infection and, and, and um, chronic osteitis. So obviously chronic osteitis, the terminology does not include acute infections, and then fracture-related infections can be acute, or it can later become chronic. And then the, the term, terminology of chronic osteomyelitis would also be relevant um, to use. So, um, one of the problems with fracture-related infections historically compared to prosthetic joint infection is that uh, the, uh, there's been a lot of work going into prosthetic joint infections to have a uniform uh, uh, diagnos diagnostic strategies, treatment strategies. Um, and um, less work has been done historically on fracture-related infection. Luckily, that's changed, and recently there's been a big international working group looking at fracture-related infection. So fracture-related infections, or FRIs and PJIs, both address orthopedic implant-related infection, but there's important differences. In fracture-related infection, you also have to consider that there's a bony injury that might be united or might not. There's often a poor soft tissue, and you also have to think of the patient condition, other injuries, and so forth. But one good thing about fracture-related infection is that there's the potential to remove the implant um, following union. And that's why the approach is slightly different. Of course, with a PJI, your uh, eventual aim is to have a fracture, uh, infection-free joint. With a fracture-related infection, you might have residual infection until union, which you can address after union. 
So um, it's a very important slide specifically for those uh, doing exams. Um, uh, this is how we diagnose it. So there's both confirmatory and suggestive criteria. So pre-surgery or pre-operatively, a confirmatory criteria would be a fistula or a sinus um, or in surgery, the presence of pus. Then post-operatively, confirmatory criteria is a positive cultures from two specimens um, or the presence of more than five polymorphs per high microscopy field. So in other words, histology can also help making a definitive diagnosis. So if the patient have a sinus, basically they have a fracture-related infection. You don't need any of the further criteria present. If there's no hard sign, so there's no sinus, then you look at the suggestive criteria, which can be preoperatively, Clinical signs, this is warmth, redness, uh, radiologically, so signs of loosening, periosteal reaction, new joint diffusion, elevated uh, inflammatory markers, uh, or persistence of new onset wound, <coughs> wound drainage. And then there's multiple surgery, surgical options, just biopsy, and there's in cases where we would consider chronic suppressive antibiotic therapy and um, where we need the diagnosis prior to definitive surgery. The term DARE also applies to fracture-related infection, which is debridement, antibiotics, and implant retention. And um, yeah, um, sometimes we just have to do an implant exchange or removal. Uh, and again, in some cases, there might be no realistic chance of success, and the only option is an amputation. Again, the surgical principles are exactly the same bone and soft tissue debridement, bed space management with local antibiotics, skeletal stabilization, and then managing the defect, both of the bone and the soft tissue. There's no clear guidelines on the duration of infection in fracture-related infection. When is it acute and when does it become chronic? Some sources use less than six weeks or more than six weeks, but uh, this is not included in the definition. Um, specifically, this is important when we look at whether you can retain the implant. So one is less likely to eradicate the infection while you retain the implant with an increase in duration. And there's no clear cut off, but after 10 to 12 weeks, you're unlikely to successfully eradicate the infection while retaining the implant. Sometimes we might still choose to retain the implant because the fracture might be very close to union and it might be a nail that's well fixed, uh, um, but you're less likely to be successful in eradicating the infection after 10 to eight weeks. And this is just a graphic representation of that. You can see here early on, so zero to three weeks, you've got a 86 to six to 100% success rate with eradicating infection uh, while maintaining the implant. This with washout, the bridement, got specific antibiotics, and that decreases over time to after 10 weeks, it drops down to like sort of below 67%. So what to do with the implant? Well, implants can be either removed, it can be exchanged, or it can be retained. And this depends from case to case on, either the, dura on the duration, the stability of the fixation, the potential to unite, the integrity of the soft tissue, and the susceptibility of the pathogen. Nails versus plate, while a nail is an independent risk factor for uh, not being able to eradicate the infection, because obviously the nail normally involves all, no spans the whole bone. However, nail fixation is so biologic that even with residual infection, you often still get union. And that's in most nail cases with infection, we can successfully, especially the early ones, successfully, uh, even if we can't eradicate the infection, we can successfully suppress the infection until, until um, Union. And the reason why there's no specific time frames is that all the evidence base is unable to give us specific safe intervals. So this is an example of an early fracture-related infection with a nail that you can see as well fixed following the gunshot, the draining sinus, but well fixed, no signs of loosening, potential to unite. So we treat this with a suppressive culture specific suppressive antibiotic therapy. So wash out special uh, sampling and culture-specific antibiotics versus this case, except for the hypertrophic non-union, you can see a large lucency. This nail is rattling around in the canal uh, and it's infected and there's no chance of 
disuniting if you try and retain the canal. Again, same from uh, uh, Lens article. So with fracture related infection, providing the fixation is stable and there's progressive union or potential to unite, you can retain your implant. So those are the two important um, provisions for you to retain your implant. If the fixation is not stable or there's no progress in union, then it's infected from union and you need to treat it as a type 4 osteitis, which is segmental resection and then manage the bone defect. So there's a few, I like to think of fracture-related infection as a few specific clinical scenarios. So scenario one is an acute infection. I said there's no specific time frame, but this is early after fracture fixation. You're mostly able to retain the implant. Every now and again, where there's a very high infected burden and you're unsuccessful, I say, always want to say you should worry if you have to do more than one washout or deprivance and you're not getting on top of the infection. Then that usually tells you that either there's too high a burden and you're need to remove more devitalized tissue, including the implant, or uh, you might have missed an organism and the patient's not on the right antibiotics. Second scenario is a chronic infection with a united fracture. So you can see in this now, well, this is also quite easy. Here you manage it like osteitis, and you remove the uh, implant and manage it with all the aspects of chronic osteitis. And then the third scenario is a chronic fracture-related infection with a non-union. And this here you manage like type 4 chronic osteitis, which is the debridement, dead space management, skeletal stabilization, and then management of the with management of the uh, defect bone and soft tissue. And then sometimes salvage is not possible. And uh, you know, remember our aim is to have a non-infected functional limb. So if you have a, a functionless limb um, that's infected, then it's often uh, um, better to consider an amputation. Well, choice of antibiotics. Empiric antibiotics got big question marks there. Well, in a low grade infection, just with a sinus, I often don't start empiric antibiotics and I wait for my cultures to, to come back. If a patient has a, a, a large abscess or cellulitis or systemic signs of infection, you want to start empiric antibiotics after your tissue sampling, and that should be based on local antibiotic therapy. Again, you know, especially in trauma rate and infection, we often still do narrow spectrum empiric antibiotics, as in ketazolin only. But when you do like a single stage revision for uh, prosthetic joint infection, where you want the patient to be 100% sure you cover all pathogen, you need to do, have broader spectrum empiric antibiotics, and probably the best combination in our environment would be. Um, um, meropenem and vancomycin. And we should always try and select an antibiotic that has a penetration of the biofilm. And this is in gram positive infections. We add rifampicin if it's a gram positive and sensitive. And for gram negative uh, infections, biofilm based infections, ciprofloxacin has a similar effect. It needs to be adequate dosing. And as a general rule, we use, we select antibiotics that penetrate bone and you give it in the highest possible dose. Oral versus IV, I'll say something more about that. And then a duration is usually at least six weeks. There is some work being done into possible shorter duration of antibiotic therapy. The Viva trial is a sort of landmark article that showed no difference or non-inferiority of oral antibiotics when compared to intravenous antibiotics. Important thing when we talk about infection, as you know, we get some late instances of recurrence. So we like to talk about remission, not cure. What we can say is that 90% of recurrences happen in the first year. So basically, if you get to 12 months post surgery, you can 90% sure say that the patient is infection free. Um, in um, appropriate selected cases, so that is an operating or type A and B hosts, one can achieve. Um, success rate of 80 to 90%. And this is quite good. You know, people often uh, don't like managing orthopedic infections because there's a low success rate. Well, 80-90% um, success is better than much other fields of orthopedics. Uh, where's the upper limb surgeons? You know, what's the success rate of rotated cuff repairs in elderly patients? It's, it's, you know, it's definitely below 50%. So you can actually achieve 
good results, but that is in appropriately selected cases. And it's important here to, to think of what's the worst thing that can happen. So you need to have a reasonable chance of success before you embark on a treatment strategy. Let's say a patient have a fairly functional limb with a, with a draining sinus, and now you go into a large uh, res resection and uh, it does not work, then the patient's often worse off than they were before the surgery. So you need to have a, um, a, a reasonable chance of success. And other common complications of treatment is antibiotic side effects. So future, I'd say the main thing here is that uh, there's more and more evidence that a single stage uh, reconstruction is the gold standard and one can um, increase similar uh, success rates with single stage surgery combined to um, stage surgery, uh, which used to be the gold standard for, for infection. Okay, so before we um, go look at cases, any, any questions? Okay, perfect. Let's let's move on to some cases. And now let me just look at the participants here. So this is the first case. This is a 35-year-old gentleman presents. Um, can't remember exactly how long, but a few weeks after I am now for a um, for a gunshot of the tibia and he presents with a draining sinus. So let me just look at the list here. Omar, you here? Do you want to do you want to have a go? Do you want to tell me what we're dealing with and what you would do? Um, can you hear me, Bob? Yes, I can hear um, you. Uh, yeah. Um, just 30 minutes of this time here. I think you really, so the history is how long? Is it? Um, I can't remember exactly, but a uh, couple of weeks, a few weeks, a few weeks down the line. Okay, and now the patient. Say again? Sorry, you're Sorry, breaking up. Think, yeah, my network is bad. Um, I didn't hear okay, very well the patient. Okay, no problem. So, Andisha, are you there? Hey, Andisha, maybe a good practice for the exam. Uh, yeah. Look at the, look at this. Um, this is shortly, so a few weeks after uh, female uh, tibial nail for a gunshot, present with a draining sinus. Uh, what's your diagnosis, and what would be your treatment strategy? Okay, so this is a fracture-related infection. Uh, we have confirmatory criteria here, which is sinus discharge. Uh, looking to the to the tip, tip X-ray with the nail was fixed with the nail. Looks like there is no sign of union and it's will alignment. Um, so my strategy is optimize the host and uh, dealing with the soft tissue, ridiculous um, debridement, uh, soft tissue. And um, so it's, uh, and and um, um, uh, retention the implant. So- Okay, uh, good. So, so basically a day. Yeah. yeah. So this is what was done. And now he is a few months uh, down the line. Um, and you can see here that the fracture is now united, but he still has a draining sinus. Okay, so we'll go to the, to the next step, which is fracture united. So the, <clears throat> it's a reason now to remove the implant and, uh, uh, and do uh, maybe you can do another debridement, uh, get the culture again and uh, continue the antibiotic. Okay, so you said you will remove the implant, the bride, uh, antibiotics, what else? And soft tissue reconstruction. Ah, yeah, so it doesn't need a soft tissue, so it doesn't need a flap, you should always consider that, but what's the one important aspect that you left out there? Which is uh, host optimization. So you know, I say is dead space management. Yeah, this so funny. this is always, you know, controversial. Of course, just taking out this implant and debriding it, your chances of success is not zero. But um, uh, you know, I, every case I take to theatre, I try and optimize the success rate as much as possible. So I always have a strategy for the dead space management. So when I take out an infected implant, you can see here massive, sorry, 
massive lysis around the snail and just taking out the nail uh, would have a decreased chance of success. So in yeah. this case, um, judicious debridement, which we do indirectly by just reaming after nail of removal, lavage, and then this is a sort of a antibiotic cement nail made over a liser of wire that we leave in for six weeks. Now, um, and then we have to take it out. Now, as I said, mostly aim for single stage surgery for patient convenience, but also for uh, optimal use of resources. Um, this needs a second theater episode just to remove the nail. Um, and uh, so that's one of the problems. One of the, the positives is that it's fairly cheap and a high success rate. So just these are sort of just the early series of my cases, 30 patients with a minimum of 12 month follow up, only two recurrences. So it's 93% success rate. So successful, but the irritating thing is that you need a second theater episode. So as an alternate strategy, what I've been starting to do recently, this is another similar case where you can see an infected nail. This patient had a fix and flap procedure. So we had a 3B open fracture that had a nail and a flap in the same setting. He did well from the uh, point of view that he united, but he developed chronic sepsis, so he has a draining sinus, but the fracture is united. So again, same story, implant removal, judicious debridement through reaming. And here we filled the dead space with injectable uh, synthetic graft in the form of prodens with antibiotics. Now, as I said before, this is 30, we use 30 cc of prodens mix of antibiotics, even though it's cheaper than um, cheaper than the ceramide, it's still 28,000 Rand for 20 cc. So here we use about 50,000 Rand worth of synthetic graft. However, we avoid a whole second episode of, um, you, you know, a visit to the theater, which is obviously beneficial. So moving towards uh, a single stage for type one, for type one as well. Uh, hi, okay. Prof. Maya. Yes, Maya, Maya, Maya. Go for it, yeah. Just yes. technically, that proteins, how do you get it in? Are you putting in like a thick feeding cube? Yeah, Just like a, a, yeah, like a feeding cube. So this is sort of a little bit of work in pro, pro, progress because the injection the, um, injection needle that comes with it is not long enough to inject down the canal. And um, uh, we have a sort of a suction tubing that we use to pass down the canal and that we inject with. Okay, all right, thanks, Prof. Maritz, can I also ask a question quickly? Yes, of uh, course. In, in these fracture related infections, so you've now achieved union, you've got a sinus. When you take the nail out, would you ever consider CT in those cases? I know in chronic osteomyelitis, you're not really a fan. But in this case, you can't always presume it's a medullary infection just because you got a nail down because that was originally an open fracture. So would yeah, you ever no, do a CT to see what sort of, now uh, you're treating it like a chronic osteomyelitis, what your stage is in the Chernian model? Yeah, so, so um, uh, the answer is yes, you can. Um, I always, always have a careful look at the, at the X-ray and all infected nails are not type ones. They are infected nails that, that are type three. You can usually yeah. see the sequestrum on plain extra on one of the few, or one of the views. I always curate the sinus as well and intro up after I remove the nail, carefully look whether there's a sort of dense area uh, of sequestrum. So for sure, so I don't routinely see them, but it wouldn't be wrong. So just to, to miss like a cortex, to, a cortex osteomyelitis, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I must say it's it's mostly it's mostly quite obvious. So once the cases where you have to be aware of that is where there's a large cavity um, at the old fracture site. So most yeah. infected nail, the sinus is at the screw site because that's a basically a uh, communication of the intramedullary canal to the outside and the yeah. intramedullary sepsis track around the screw holes. So if there's a large sinus at the old fracture site, then you should uh, carefully look 
in that in that cavity to make sure that there's not a small cortical sequestrum there. And one of the treatment failures, of the two treatment failures that then in L was a small a case that had a small sequestrum. And after nail removal and cement nail, they still developed a sinus and the MRI then showed a small sequestrum in the in the cortex. But that's one out of you know 30. Okay, fair enough. So not really worth it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, Marit. Yes, Ashley. Uh, hi. Uh, sorry. I, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, for your cement nail, uh, what do you use to make it? Do you so you use something like Palacos, you know, a PMMA type thing, or do you use uh, osteo sets? Do you sort of make your own sort of osteo set? No, composite? no. So those cement nails around the wire is, is from cement. So PMMA. So okay. I just use a PMMA that contains uh, a highest possible dose of, um, of gentamicin. Gentamicin is the antibiotic with the best illusion properties. So it will elude from cement for up to four weeks. Um, vancomycin has got very poor elution properties, only eludes from the cement for up to 48 hours. So um, I only use that when it's sort of known MRSA. So you can use Smart G, you can use Palacos, uh, you can use Scopal GNB, um, but you just need to select a PMMA with, uh, that contains as much gentamicin as, as possible because we don't have gentamicin available in powder form in South Africa. So you cannot mix in gentamicin into your cement. But I'll never make the cement nails with something like osteocent. It's too brittle it will, and it will dissolve and that sort of defies um, defies the purpose. It doesn't sit uh, rigid enough that you can make a nail from it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, let me just look on the list of who's the next exam candidate. Jono, do you want to have a look at this? So this is a lady with a chronic venous stasis ulcer over the lateral aspect of her, uh, her lower leg. Um, with a chronic non-healing ulcer, and this is a CT and an and a MRI scan. Yeah, um, thanks, Maritz. So looking at an, an AP X-ray and then an MRI sequence uh, coronal plane, as you said, um, you can see she's got some, <clears throat> you can see that the soft tissue is contracted over the fibula on the lateral side, and she's got some, some bone changes, some, uh, some sort of patchy lysis throughout the fibula with uh, what looks like um, looks like it could be osteomyelitis of the of the fibula on the MRI um, can see that she's also there's very little in the way of soft tissue over the fibula there's um, communication with the with the outside so um, I'd be suspecting a, a, um, a type 3 um, or sorry, a, a type, you know, type two or type three uh, osteom churnium made osteomyelitis here with the with the overlying ulcer. Um, okay, and so, what would be your your treatment strategy? So I'd want to I'd want to <clears throat> just I mean this this is essentially um, classifying the local disease. So decide whether it was was, was stage two or three. Then I would. Um, optimize stratify and optimize the the host um, the modifiable host characteristics um, which we've spoken about and then um, <clears throat> for this I think the, the the important thing is going to be debridement but then soft tissue reconstruction and dead space management so my debridement uh, would I'd go according to these images and debride the necrotic um, and infected bone judicious judicious debridement and then um, take biopsies i would i would need a uh, flap coverage here yeah, because uh, she's going to she's got chronic venous stasis ulcers she's got poor soft tissue so she's going to need a she's going to need a flap cover for for soft tissue um the dead space management um you know i i, I imagine if i'm just if it's just uh if it's just stage two i'm going to be just de-roofing the the infected area then um yeah, maybe maybe some ant an antibiotic uh, an antibiotic um, uh, uh, bone graft insert, some some uh, bone graft substitute, and then uh, it doesn't need stabilization. Yeah, good. So look, um, 
by definition, if there's just superficial osteitis like type 2, which is you know quite rare, one can just do what's called a decortication. So take the cortex away, obviously the fibula being a narrow bone. I don't think it would be wrong to call this a type 3. If you look at the MRI, though, that like looks fairly normal, except for the outer cortex of bone that's actually exposed. So you could see like brown necrotic uh, fibula in the base of the wound but the actual rest of the bone looks fine. So I would, that's why I called this type two. And yeah, like you said, it's this dispensable bone. So resect the fibula and then uh, the soft tissue reconstruction or the flap. This is a free radial forearm flap. Is the dead space management and um, inserted some caracol underneath just to deliver some local, some local antibiotics. And that's her at a year. You can see the flap was, was everything is well healed and she's in, she's infection free. Okay, so this is a, let me look down the list now, John uh, Chichi. So Chichi, this is a 40 year old, um, previously infected uh, tibial plateau orif that presents with uh, this x-ray and the clinical picture there on the right with a draining sinus if you can't make out what's going on there. Can you hear me, Chichi? Okay, Mike, maybe do you want to, uh, maybe it looks like he's disappearing off my screen, maybe he's having some connection or issues. Okay, so Adrian Latchell, a skeletal mature patient on the right uh, knee in question, and then a uh, coronal uh, MRI, as well as a clinical picture, commenting on the uh, x-ray first. One can appreciate uh, what looks like sclerotic bone. It largely involves the tibia. I can't appreciate any abnormal bone in the fibula. Um, sorry, on the, on the femur, apologies. Um, so, yeah, a, a large mark a large aspect of sclerotic bone, mainly on the lateral and posterior condyle uh, with some surrounding lysis uh, uh, around that sclerotic mo margin. I'm concerned that there may be some sequestrum there and involucrum around the outside in keeping with the diagnosis of chronic osteomyelitis. Um, commenting on the MRI, you can appreciate that large dead space um, or the large hypo-intense area, uh, which looks highly suspicious of a sequestrum, a large uh, section of dead bone with hyper-intensity around the outside, which may be a, a joint reaction in the beginning of an involucrum. And yeah. then the clinical picture shows a sinus on the left, which is one of the um, conf confirmatory, um, well, not confirmatory signs, but highly suspicious. Yeah, it is a conf it is confirmatory, confirmatory signs. Yeah. Yeah. It's the right term, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, my uh, plan here first would be um, to stage this. This It looks like there's still a little bit of structure here. I'm not convinced this is unstructural. So a grade three on the churnia and MADA, I would like to optimize the host, uh, uh, particularly with modifiable risk factors. Then I would like to get um, a sequestrectomy and a biopsy and treat this with appropriate antibiotics as well as um, dead space management for this large sequestrum that I'm going to take out. And then I would also have to uh, assess what soft tissue reconstruction is needed once I do a judicious debridement of this wound. I expect quite a large soft tissue defect that I'm going to have to consider my soft tissue closures for. Yeah, so obviously difficult without history. So here you can see that um, that hyperdense area just below the plateau is actually um, um, uh, previous. They took the plate out and they put in genta, uh, oh, okay. genta beads. Okay. And, uh, so I can just see one that. note on this black. Yes, for sure, sequestrum is, is hypo intense. Uh, however, sequestrum will never be this big because remember, sequestrum is cortical bone. So, um, okay, fair you enough. Know, so it's sliver. So if you see such a large hypo dense area in a cavity with osteitis, it's often air. And I, I know, you know, um, um, Ahmad seen a case recently with me with a whole distal femur at this hyper dense area on MRI and the, and 
Um, I often get a phone call from the radiologist asking what's in the le leg, and it's air. It's through the sinus. There's a large air uh, sure. cavity. Okay. So, okay. so this is, um, and not in this case, because this is the cement that's hypodense, but if you see a large uh, hypodense area like this, is often, often air. Okay, so this is what was done. So here you can see this was just filled with osteocet. This is a beat. You can see the whole cavity is filled. He had a free ALT flap in the same sitting. And uh, like I said, if the bone's in continuity, you know, we call it a type three, it, it's very seldom or never that you have to destabilize the bone with your resection. And here you can see at six weeks, can you see here there's a little bit of osteocet less left. So there's a thing about osteocet, it dissolves, it delivers antibiotics, but it doesn't really stimulate bone formation. So there ends up being a cavity again. And this is at three years, you can see a good clinical uh, um, outcome and no signs of a of a recurrence. Just going back to the chat there, sorry, I, I think it's Kim, I only saw that uh, comment late asking about an MRI uh, or ankle involvement for that case. Yes, for sure, that's on, on the one of the uh, benefits of doing an MRI scan. And um, they, they, in that case though, uh, there was no ankle and no ankle involvement, so the MRI scan excluded ankle involvement. Okay, so let's see. Chichi says he's got connection issues. Then let's who's next on the list here. Pravesh, do you want to look at this case? This is a 33 year old male, previous grade 3A open tibia, treated in an X fix, and now presents with a draining signs type A host. Yes, Maurice, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, what do you think? Again, so this is a fracture-related infection because there is a confirmatory criteria and there was a fracture that was treated. And it, basically on this x-ray, it's an AP uh, x-ray of the tip fib that shows a non-united uh, fracture of the mid-shaft junction, uh, proximal to third, distal third of the tibia. There was also a fibular fracture that seems united um, and there is signs of soft tissue sort of um, infection. And we know that there is a confirmatory criteria, so it will be a fracture related infection. And how long were the X kept for? Probably more than six weeks. So it's already a chronic uh, FRI with a, a with a confirmatory criteria. So in this case, again, we will go with our principles of classifying uh, the type of of infection using the Cherny and, and Madi classification. That would be uh, probably um, localized, probably. I think it should be a type two or three again. No, no, the, the, but, but the fracture is complete. I think it's a diffuse, probably a type four. Um, yeah, so the bone here, the bone's not in continuity. So this is an infected non union. So it's a type four um, according to the Cherny and Madi classification. Yeah, so then we'll. Again, it's a type A host, uh, stratify optimization of the host. And then we'll have to go to our principle of chronic osteomyelitis to manage this um, non-union infected, infected non-union FRI. So it would be judicious debridement uh, of, the, of, the, of the wound of soft, soft tissue and bony debridement. First of all, an MRI, yes, to, to assess what, um, what to, to what extent we need to debride to assess the sequestrum and yeah. involvement formation and any where the sinus tract is going to, to know with, up to where we need to debride. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, MRI is not a, it's a nice to have, it's not a must have, but it does help you to plan. And uh, then you can just go to theater with a better, otherwise you have to have a lot of plus minuses. You know, you can here cut down to sort of bleeding bone, um, but it's nice if you have an MRI scan before you can plan here that you're probably, this is, you can see there's no normal marrow signal in this bone. Uh, if you go back here, so you can see that a lot of that sclerotic bone doesn't really have much sort of blood supply and, and that's obviously needs to be uh, uh, resected, whereas there's some abnormal marrow signal here, but um, that, that uh, bone should still have blood supply. And then basically this, the resection uh, that was needed matched exactly that error on MRI scan, and then ju that just helps you to plan to plan the surgery. So here you end up with a bone defect, and then I would just say the answer you would uh, you would reconstruct the bone defect according to the appropriate technique for the size and the 
segment involved. In this case, in the tibia, use bone transport. There you can see uh, 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 bone transport with a stacked DSF. And that's at union showing, you know, united um, tibia of acceptable alignment and a good, good clinical outcome. Everyone happy with that? So um, just to show you that things obviously don't always go well. Um, is, did someone want to ask something? I guess those things that always go well. This is a, a complex pylon fracture in a patient that wasn't such a good surgical host. Uh, it was an open pylon. I think even from initially earlier, the patient had sepsis, never got to definitive management and resected all the infected bone, put in a cement spacer. So again, a, a fracture-related infection, but with a um, segmental oh. defect. So basically a type um, a four chronic os osteitis now that we um, intervened. And then again, that, uh, so it's a, basically a bone defect in the distal tibia that the bone transport arthrodesis. Uh, as you can see, a separate osteotomy, transport that segment down to the dock on the talus. It looked quite good, removed the frame. And um, you can see here, it looks like there's at least an area of where the tibia is united to the talus, but probably was a little bit tenuous. And then after walking for a few months, presented back with a non-union at the docking site. Um, but luckily infection free. Uh, so then did prepare the subtalar joint and that a hind foot fusion nail. And you can see this a few months down the line with uh, good progress in union at the docking site, subtalar joint joints completely fused and still infection free. So often with these cases, the answer is just to not give up. And you know, often uh, you might have you might have need what we call a complex reconstruction, which means you need more than one procedures to achieve your uh, goal that you set, set out of. Another structural case, so you can see this is a distal tibia that was plated with a defect. And, you know, people call this a non-union. Uh, you know, I would say I would have never expected this fracture to unite, you know, uh, osteoblasts don't jump. So we would have never expected this, this to heal. But this is now a few months down the line, also a draining sinus. So it is a fracture related infection that you can also call a structural chronic osteitis. So in him, we managed to debride and manage the defect by acutely shortening it. So this, the, the, um, there's no spacer here because basically the, the um, Dead space management's acute shortening. Now, of course, it's a rather large shortening, probably of three, four centimeters. So at the same time, there's simultaneous proximal lengthening to give a missed length back. It's just different to bone transport where you maintain the length and then transport. And here he is at the end of the treatment with good alignment and everything united and infection free. Okay, so this is a, a interesting case. Let's look down the list here. Um, wish you've had a go. Galroy, I think everyone is anyone doing exams have had a have had a go. Galroy, do you want to look at this and tell me what you think? Hi, Maritz. There's a 41 year old, yeah, I can hear you well. 41 year old that presents with a pathological fracture after trivial trauma. Um, it's a proximal third uh, transverse fracture uh, through a lytic lesion. Um, not marked soft tissue swelling. Uh, it's noted on the x-ray. It's in slight varus uh, and shortened. Uh, MRI. Uh, uh, yeah, so I don't it's, know, it's, a single, it's a single slice. The main reason for that MRI is to just show, obviously looking at this, this is someone not known with out. infection that just presents with a pathological fracture. Um, even though there's features of infection, yeah, we wanted to rule out uh, what would be more common, mm -hmm. a pathological fracture through a 
tumor or a metastasy, but on the MRI scan confirmed features of chronic osteitis. He also then had an IND and drained a large amount of pus and had multiple uh, staph cultures. This is unusual for an adult not known with osteitis to present like this, but it doesn't uh, happen occasionally. Like we've got another patient recently that presented like this. Okay, so what now? So you've got confirmatory, this is infection because no, he is, didn't have a sinus, but he had suggestive radiology and he had an IND which cultured an MSSA. Yeah, so this is the infected non-union type 4. It's markedly unstable. Um, now, so it's not a non-union, to... it's an acute fracture, um, but it is a type or 4. Unstable, yeah, rather unstable than, yeah, than a non-union. It's a structural, it's a type 4 chronic yeah. osteitis, yeah. Um, so the plan is to optimize your host. Um, local soft tissue, if it's uh, in the femur, it should be, um, should be well padded. Um, resect um, or debride, uh, do a judicious uh, debridement um, of infected bone or dead bone rather. Um, and then possibly an intramedullary um, uh, device. Uh, a load sharing device here. Yeah. No, okay. Oh, just so, just to show you what the, after the debridement. So, just look at the left picture. So, there's a massive defect. I can't remember okay. 12 or 13 or something centimeters after the debridement cement spacer. So, yeah, you can definitely use a nail that would be a potential, but you need to have a strategy to manage that defect. Try and avoid ex -fix, external fixators or. Mm -hmm. um, frames in the femur just because it's not so well tolerated but I was a poor host and and didn't want to uh, use if you wanted to use an intramedullary nail in the femur you can do it in conjunction with like the masculine technique um, sure. but here we did bone transport so distal to proximal bone transport with a rail on his leg it was obviously a long transport so this guy was in a frame for I think 18 months but sure. he united femur and he was infection free and it went well, but it's quite difficult for the patient and for myself having someone in a femur X fix for more than a for more than a year. Yeah, prolonged. Yeah. So this is a, another case to just show you guys. Uh, this is of course a fracture related infection. Um, fracture related infection presents with a draining sinus. You can see here that the Metalware is completely loose and has failed catastrophically. Now, so this is a type four. You will basically manage it according to chronic osteitis principles. So type four is the structural, because an infected non-union, and the treatment would be a remove the metalware, judicious to bribe. And in her case, luckily in the humerus, you can manage it with shortening. So a large shortening, single stage uh, debridement, large shortening very stable plating, and this is um, osteocet graft, um, because you could see the big holes in the bone there where the screws was the erosion. So look here, if you look in the lateral, the plate is almost in the bone. Uh, so osteocet to fail for the defect, and that is heard 18 months united with good function. You can see that a humerus is significantly shortened on the other side, but, but that's no functional, functional, functional deficit. And this is just something fun or something different to show. And this is a similar case to the one with the pathological fracture that I sh showed. This patient presented to someone else with a pathological fracture from osteitis that basically just I did it and then put the patient in an X fix. You know, if you look at this MRI, there's a large abscess, um, there's a sequestrum there in the cortex. Uh, there's an abnormal marrow signal in the bone here. This is never going to heal. Uh, this was already a few months down the line. And, um, you, know, you, you, it, you know, in other words, you can't just splint the, splint the fracture. It's not, going, it's not going to heal. So here I did a first stage. So I resected the devitalized bone, put the patient in temporary x fix cement spacer. This is not something that's designed by myself, but it's a technique that, that described by a Australian limb reconstruction surgeon, uh, given Tetsworth, using what's called a truss cage. So it's a titanium mesh cage that's 3D printed. 
So it's like a combination of masculine, but with some structural stability. One of the problems with masculine take a long time to unite. So here uh, we 3D printed a titanium mesh cage for the defect with a hole uh, in the middle that a nail can go through. This is uh, the Neil Campbell, the engineer's drawings and planning. This is our trial. So this is a metatan. Of course, the nail is not completely straight. So you need to make sure that it can accommodate in the cage. This is a little plastic model that it printed for me. Here we just make sure that the nail would go through. This is what the titanium version looks like then. Then we use Rima, the RIA system, RIMA irrigated aspirator system to harvest um, graft from the other leg. And Cancellus graft, we pack it in this cage. So the cage would give immediate stability but then with time would also um, provide some structural stability. And here you can see this is a couple of weeks after the surgery, the cage in place. And this is now at six months. You can actually see how the bone is uniting along the, because obviously this is all packed with, with, cancellous, bone, with cancellous bone. There's just another technique that you can use in certain cases. And I've done a few of these now with, with good clinical results. This in another interesting case, I've only seen one and recently a second case of this. This is a margillin ulcer. So this is a chronic osteitis with a large, basically, ulcer fungating match on the fibula. I can actually see the spacious tibia through the base of the wound on the lateral aspect of a leg. And something so aggressive, you should always worry about uh, metastasis. And she, had a, she was an IV heroin addict that had this chronic infection and had a kept injecting in trying to hope to get something into a system and uh, had a margin and also of her of her um, the also of her lower leg and we treated that with a amputation so the take-home message really is the importance of a multidisciplinary approach and patient optimization to remember that there's no single strategy that will be successful in all cases. Um, we do have guidelines though, which if you follow the guidelines every time um, and you individualize it for every case that you can achieve success in a high percentage of cases. Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, hi, well, it's, uh, uh, it's Ashley. That uh, titanium cage, uh, uh, what sort of the, the, the maximum size of defect you can use it for in a femur? I, I don't think there's any uh, clear cutoff. And, uh, you know, as the technique was first described by a small case series, I think, of, of four cases. And, and, and that same unit then later probably 17. I think they've done 40 odd cases now. Um, I think in South Africa, we've done about seven or eight cases that I know of um, between myself and, and, and Nandu. The biggest one I've done is about, uh, was about eight or nine centimeters. Uh, I do think you can go, uh, go longer. You know, one of the ways that it works, obviously, is that in time you want bone to form. So you need to make sure that you can harvest enough cancellous bone to, to manage that defect. But there's no clear cutoff. And some of the cases described in the literature has got bigger defects, but the, the um, biggest one I've had is eight, eight centimeter defect. Okay, thanks. Anyone else, any other questions? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you, Paul. Have a good evening and see you tomorrow.